Today I want to talk about startups. And I want to talk about why you should validate your startup idea with Webflow. So how many of you guys are building a startup or would like to be building a startup? Working on okay, cool. a couple. So you know when I think about startups, when I think about marketing, it's a lot like surfing. Right? We all want to be catching that perfect trend, riding it in, getting the barrel. Uh, the only problem is that it turns out a lot of startups actually end up over here uh, or here. So they had some trouble along the way, and you know you've told everybody, but nobody seems to care. And you know the reason this is is because startup founders they really like to think of cool ideas, uh, but they don't effectively validate those ideas with people who. Uh, agree enough to sign up and make a purchase. Because in, in business, ideas are cheap, right? Everybody has those. What matters is having customers. So this is the market adoption curve, and it's actually showing that 40% of the market won't even use your product until after the early majority is using it. And the reason this is, uh, if you look at a study by CB Insights, it shows that the top 42% at number one the reasons that startups fail is actually no market need. So the problem with this is we don't just have a bad idea, but we haven't really questioned our assumptions and proved that we're actually right about things like who we think our audience is, where our audience is, what we think our value proposition is, what motivates people to engage with our brand, what drives brand value, in other words, repeat purchases. And to go even further, we need to take these assumptions and actually map them to a customer journey so that we can answer one specific question, which is, how do we create a customer? And in order for us to answer this question, we need to run experiments. So we need to turn our assumptions into experiments so before we do that, let's take a look at a couple startups that actually did that. Let's look at what Dropbox did, which had the idea of putting cloud file storage in the uh, file storage in the cloud. They put up a just a description, and they actually explained what the product did, and even said that they hadn't launched yet, uh, but they would be keeping people updated uh, if you entered in your email. Right, so pretty simple opt-in form. And then they started to expand this since they added a video and finished out the sign-up form. And they actually uh, started listing their key benefits on their pricing page so they could clearly communicate their value proposition. And DoorDash did the exact same thing. Does anybody know DoorDash in San Francisco? Okay, it's a food delivery service. And they gave a talk at Stanford here. I'm just going to play a quick one. So we decided to create a simple experiment um, with restaurant delivery. We spent about an afternoon just putting together a really quick landing page. And when I went on the internet, I found some PDF news of you know restaurants in Palo um, stuck it up there, and then had a phone number at the bottom, and, and which was our personal cell phone number actually, and that was it. We we, we put up the landing page. We called it PaloTodelivery.com, and this is actually what it looked like. Um, you know, super super, you know, simple, ugly. So that's what DoorDash did. And they actually ended up growing that startup uh, well into the millions and getting uh, venture capital. So then there's Robinhood. Does anybody know Robinhood? It's a US based investing startup. Uh, and they were able to generate millions of submissions by clearly stating on their landing page their key differentiator, which was zero commission stock trading. And they included a viral share option, so once you signed up, you would actually be able to share that landing page with other users 
to get additional signups for Robinhood. So they really grew tremendously with that. Lastly, here's one of my clients at Cohab. Uh, and they do hyper-localized apartments social networking. So we did the exact same thing actually on Webflow. We put up a landing page uh, and stated the value proposition and we asked people to sign up for early access. And we included screenshots of what the app might look like for specific features uh, to deliver on that value proposition. So activities happening this week, groups formed within the building. But before any of these startups validated their experiments, they asked this question, how do they model, test, and validate the assumptions with real data? And it starts with defining the audience. In other words, what attributes describe this audience? So this could be things like their location, the demographics, uh, what city are the, is the audience, and what age is the audience? What gender are they? Could also be their interests. Oh, what's their household income and job title? Could also be their interests, which is what brands does this audience like? What products do they use? Do they like luxury or cost friendly? What shows do they watch? What influencers do they follow? And then what's going to be important when you start advertising is your website analytics which is what channels did the audience come from? What devices were they using? How many pages did they visit? What was their session time? And what conversions did they complete? We're gonna take those assumptions and define a customer avatar. And these assumptions we'll use to test with, but they might actually not be right. And what we're trying to figure out here is who is the customer, right? So how do we create that customer? And we create customers by creating customer relationships. So we need to know that you know, customers, they don't buy right away. And in order for us to drive purchase behavior, we need to think about the customer journey and the content that we're promoting through that customer journey. <clears throat> because everything we do with our content will ultimately be strengthening the customer relationship and drive us closer to that user goal. And in marketing, this is known as a campaign. So it's a organized course of action that helps promote or sell a product or service. And we can actually model these campaigns in Webflow uh, to create these campaign experiments and validate our content through each stage of the customer journey. So in Webflow, we'll first go to the top CMS tab here and create a new collection. Here's a few default collections built into Webflow, like blog posts, projects, and events. And we might decide to use those to nurture our audience, but let's go back to the funnel, which might look like this in Google Analytics. What we want to do is we actually want to design the collections that could work across these stages of the funnel to achieve specific goals. So at the top of the funnel, oops, at the top of the funnel, we might create content to drive website visits like blog posts, ebooks, guides, and checklists. In the interest phase, in the middle of the funnel, we might decide to create webinars, case studies, email courses. And then to drive purchase behavior, we might do a free consultation or a coupon or a free trial. But let's take a look at actually what a lead magnet collection would look like in Webflow. Uh, for example, if we were going to create an ebook or an email course, we might have a headline, a subheadline, key benefits, and a call to action. But then we're also going to create this layout experience, which we can add options to, to later select the template when we want to create new items. So the next phase of once we've modeled that campaign experiment is to actually design the campaign experiment, which is the templates in Webflow. 
And when we design our campaign experiments, we want to design multiple layout experiences, which we can use to test with each of our campaigns. And these template experiences are going to be based on the type of messaging that we want to promote. So you can think of the data as the content and the template as the container which provides the experience for the user. For example, let's say we created two new campaigns to drive awareness and new leads, a checklist and an email course. Here's a, uh, what we can do. We can take our collection template for lead promos and set up different experiences for each campaign. So here's an example of that checklist download template where we might use conditional visibility. It's hard to see it, but there it is. Uh, you can set up conditional visibility for free downloads to use this template and bind your data there. If we wanted to have a simpler experience for, let's say, an email course, uh, we can use the layout experience to select simple opt-in. And then we can add a modal to give users a different experience to finish that flow design. So on Webflow, we're trying to drive the customer experience. But the customer experience is actually on the channel. So we want to also consider how we can automate the full experience. Let's go back to the pop-up, where we might collect new leads from that modal form. We can actually use Xavier to create an automation which integrates with our Webflow site that pulls the data from the form and then goes over to Intercom and creates a new lead, uh, which I don't know if anyone's using Intercom. It's an awesome CRM and live chat tool. But you can create a new lead and pass in the name and email. And then we can send a custom post request to Flash tags, which would create a campaign tag using user ID, and then enroll those leads into Intercom. And we can then use that campaign tag to enroll those leads into an automated follow-up series, where we can send them additional content and nurture them even further. <coughs> so after we've set up the customer journey, we then want to analyze and optimize those experiments. And we do this with Google Analytics and Google Optimize. And we want to review things like our audience report, <coughs> which is what's the age of the audience, what's the gender of the audience, what country and city are they in. And then we want to look at the channels report to determine where did this traffic come from, uh, what was the bounce rate, Typically, we're trying to reduce the bounce rate. And also the conversion rate. So did they download that resource? What was our conversion rate? So we want to look at these data points. And then we want to use Google Optimize to create this funnel where we can see where users might come in. What's the conversion rate? Where did they actually drop off? And how do we optimize that part of the funnel? And in Google Optimize, we can actually set up A-B tests to optimize what isn't working. And we can take into account uh, our assumptions and then make changes based on our data. So we can look at things like, how is our copy performing? Can we update the copy? Can we add new media? Can we change our targeting? Uh, or can we actually update all those landing pages which had a high bounce rate? And once we've done that, we can start seeing the assumptions that are actually validated. We can see in our analytics, this is a cohort analysis looking at the retention curve for when users come in on day one and day 30, uh, how well we've retained those users. So we'll do a test. And we might find out that users from New York City who search for Drake Scorpion uh, and visited three pages, which also clicked on the upgrade link. That's a good segment for us. So we'll validate that they have high retention, and they have a good session time. They also have an average LTV of, say, $99. In this case, it would be Europe. 
and they completed seven transactions. And that's what we're looking for. Go back. There we go. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> we want to validate those assumptions so that we can prove a very important thing, which is, do we have product market fit? Where, I'll leave you with a quote from Sean Ellis, which is a good way to validate and know whether you've reached product market fit is if at least 40% of your users would have been very disappointed if they could no longer use your product. And ultimately, you want to make things people want. So this is what we're looking for 